Sonia is our, new, is our grants director who's been with us now for seven months and I think many of you have had the opportunity to meet her. I have encouraged her today to take a few minutes out to tell us a little bit about her background and to share her passion for the success of the work that you do. I'm absolutely happy to see that Sonia is part of our staff team. As Wade has expanded his role as vice president for the foundation, in fact, he oversees all of our programs now, Sonia has made a transition that's seamless. And we welcome her as our new grants director. I know that you'll enjoy working with her as much as we do. I wish for the, you all have a great day today and enjoy, enjoy the afternoon. So with that, Sonia. Thank you, Kathy. I'll attempt to put this on here too. I can do my own, yep. Can everybody hear me okay? Gosh. So I also want to thank you for coming this afternoon. I'm, I'm always humbled to see when that Blandin Foundation puts out an invitation that so many people show up. And we don't take it lightly that you take all this time out of your busy lives to come and hang out with us. So at the end of the day, I hope you think it's worthwhile. I'm just going to check that it's working, huh? It's working. OK, so this is a bit about what we're going to be doing this afternoon. You've already heard from Kathy. And in a moment, I'd be happy to share with you a little bit. Thank you for the invitation. A little bit about myself. Um, since we'll be working together for a long time, I imagine. And then after that, I will give, uh, take a few minutes to give you an update on some of the priorities that the Blandin Foundation is undertaking this year. Um, not that we shift our priorities tremendously from year to year, but there are some subtle changes that you'll see from us, and I'd like to share what they are all about. And finally, after that, with the most excellent assistance from my colleague Bernadine Jocelyn in the back. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Bernie. Um, I will hand over the floor to Bernie um, to lead us through a discussion for the rest of the afternoon about what um, our vibrant Itasca area might look like and more about that later. But as we end, hopefully right around 4.30, if you can stay around, we would love that. Um, we're going to be serving some hot hors d'oeuvres at the end of the day. And anybody who can stay around until 5 or even after that, you're more than welcome to do that. So on that note, a little bit about myself. I appreciate the invitation, because otherwise I'm not prone to give a big story. But since I was invited to do so, I will, I will take the opportunity. Um, I grew up in a small community in Denmark, north of Copenhagen, a community just a, just a couple of thousand people. And uh, the name of the community is Nulebo, which translated means Nutville. So you can <laughs> make of that what you will. But anyway, part of my earliest member, uh, memory in, uh, in Nulebo would be that my family was one of 90 families that banded together to buy an abandoned roadside inn. And we converted that to a community center. And I was only about six years old. And that's where I spent much of my childhood. And I got my first job there as a dishwasher. And my dad, who's now retired, is still volunteering there and is the Tuesday night designated bingo caller. <laughs> and so it's, it's, it's been a huge part of my life. And that small community sense is something that I grew up with, even in a densely populated country. So I made the transition to the US, and my next community that I adopted, so to say, was the community of Sheridan, Wyoming. And I don't know, have any, have any of you guys been there? Some? Oh, quite a few. All right, then. So you know, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful community right along the Bighorn Mountains, maybe today about 15,000 people. And I'd originally um, come there as an exchange student in my teens and ended up moving back in my mid-20s to marry my high school sweetheart. And uh, I arrived there, like I said, in my mid-20s. And at that time, you know, you're at the point in your life where you begin to understand what you're capable of in community. And so that's what Sheridan offered me. Um, I 
took on leadership roles. I you know, served on the YMCA board for the annual campaign. I delivered Meals on Wheels. I helped start a Relay for Life. I became a member of Rotary. I do all of the things that you do when you grow in community and you care about that. And this is really where my love for rural community began. But what really makes the connection to here for me was that I helped start a community called the Center for a Vital Community. And it was actually a program of our local community college meant to do sort of what the Blanded Foundation does in this community, funded by an external partner. And uh, it was through that community organization that I got connected with the leadership program here that we were allowed to sort of test the BCLP program in Sheridan um, three times now and a fourth time actually coming up. But that's what connected me to here and it actually it changed my life. I went through BCLP in the mid-2000s and was never really quite the same. And uh, clearly I saw that nonprofit work is what I love to do. And, and, I, and I started to understand that there are things that, are, that exist in rural communities, be it um, maybe call it classic challenges or whatever, that we're not so populated and there is poverty and there is not so much diversity and uh, there is an aging population, but I think it made me understand that rural communities are all the more resilient and, and all the more entrepreneurial and stronger for it and, and something that I see definitely see in this community as well. I did actually have a career in, in business. I was educated in business and marketing and worked in professional services marketing. But in retrospect, that almost seems sort of a sidebar because it was really my community work that I, that I sort of lived for. But um, 2006 brought about a, a couple of tougher pro personal and uh, professional challenges for me. And I found myself on my own and made the decision to enter um, nonprofit life fully as a, as a professional and started doing consulting work. Um, many great opportunities to consult with local nonprofits, mainly in strategic planning. But um, I think that what really made me, um, made me realize exactly what I think I needed to do was a study that a foundation asked me to do. And I was so humbled to do this. They had not done anything like this before and wanted to do their first grantee evaluation study and so trusted me to go out and talk to their grantees. And it just, it just broke my heart. I, I couldn't believe what was happening, I, this relationship I hadn't seen before. I had been on your side. I was a nonprofit. I had worked to raise funds and hire staff and manage scarce resources all the time, had been turned away by foundations. And I found myself for the first time on the other side, seeing how that relationship perhaps could be a lot better. And the rest is really history. You know, I walked away from that job and thought, well, this is really what I want to do. And so you got to be careful what you ask for, because here it is. And I made a way, um, I decided to get an education in philanthropic studies, which is the closest thing you can educate yourself in if you want to be in the foundation world. You really can't go to school and get a degree in foundation work. It just doesn't exist. So anyway, I, I took the steps, got the education, and as my, my years of education were finishing up, um, this position opened up, and I find myself here. So as I said, the rest was history, and so I feel it appropriate to thank all of you who have welcomed me here so kindly, um, you in this community, my coworkers, the grants team in particular, my neighbors. I have found this to be an extraordinary community very, very welcoming, and I look forward to being here for a long time. So thank you. But back to... <laughs> thank you. But back to the work of the day to um, share a little bit more about what's happening at the Foundation now and in the coming year. Um, I wanted to walk you through just a few of our priorities and what you can expect from us in the year to come. Our mission is very stable. There is no desire to change this mission of strengthening rural communities, especially the Grand Rapids area. Many of you, um, maybe some of you who are more recent to the work with the Foundation, think of us mainly as a grant-making organization, but the Foundation really has 
just a plethora of tools that we apply to the work that we do in community. The leadership program has 6,000 alumni that they work with around the state. They usually do eight to 10 programs a year, leadership, uh, community leadership programs around the state. And I know that hundreds of people in Itasca County have been through the program. I obviously know about the program, as you know. Um, it's a wonderful uh, resource. Our public policy program, led by Bernadine, has over the last years leveraged $6 million or more in funds to help expand broadband in rural Minnesota. And this is a program that the foundation now has decided to invest in itself over the next couple of years so that work continues without the federal dollars. We're also an active partner in the Itasca Area Initiative for Student Success and support you know, the, the broad initiative that this community has taken toward ensuring student success for all students um, from cradle to career. We also like to host great conversations and again, um, you, hopefully you know that we open our doors at the foundation to you who want to host meetings there and also have a room rented over at the Central Square Mall for nonprofit use. And opportunities are also present through our communications program, thanks to Allison, who's also here. Um, in 2013, as Kathy alluded to, we will um, be working on an update to our Rural Pulse survey and again, we'll be using that tool to amplify and strengthen the voice of rural Minnesota all over the state. So our priorities have remained the same. Our, you've seen these, if you've worked with us before, our three key priorities are, are pretty much the same, but that doesn't mean um, that we approach them in the same way. So as we continue with this commitment to these key priorities, you will see us maybe change the way that we go about this. Our foundation trustees, again, in September, voiced full support for these priorities, and we expect to be committed to them for uh, the foreseeable future. Commitment to home is no accident that commitment to home is always our first priority. Those of you who've been to this conference in the past know this intimately. It's clearly the number one goal of our trustees, and our goal remains to be a stable presence in this community according to Mr. Blandin's wishes. Balancing that concern that we never be the voice or the entity that undermines the community's ability to do its own work well. We will continue to respond to a broad range of requests from this community and quite frankly, um, much broader requests from this community than any other community and we can expect that to continue next year. Your uh, at-home publication will tell you that we spend, you know, we are required to spend a minimum of 55% of all of our grants funds in this community, but on a rolling average, it ends up being 65% or even higher. Some years, especially right after the recession, I know it was 70 and even up toward 80% in order to support this community even more. And finally, under our commitment to home work in this coming year, the leadership program will host a BCL program in Big Fork, um, Marcel and Effie. And um, many of you, I know, have asked for opportunities for this kind of engagement in, in leadership and facilitation that that program and Bernie Bernadine's program does. And you should look for opportunities. In 2013, we will be providing opportunities for increasing your capacity to facilitate meetings and to host events and, and that will be coming forth in this year. <coughs> Moving on to our leadership program, many of you, like I said, are probably fam well familiar with it. The program is in its 27th year of operation now. And I, I knew before I entered this foundation that it was a good program and well known, but I am not so sure I knew just how um, revered this program is all around the country. It really is the gold star of, of uh, community leadership development programs. The leadership program is increasingly focused on what we might call re-engagement. So those of you who have been through programming, you know, you, you invariably, I would imagine, like I did, wish to re-engage with your group after you've been through the program because it is very powerful. So the leadership team has increased focus on how to do that. 
and um, they are continuously looking for those kinds of opportunities. And a, a new program that they tried in 2012 as a pilot program is to take pockets of people who have graduated from leadership programs from various communities and bring them together. So from four different communities so that we can continue to learn with the tools that we have, but from other communities. So um, we're very excited about that. And finally, our expand opportunity strategy that is a, a big and ambitious body of work that you have probably also um, heard about over the last couple of years. But in the more than 70 years of community work that we have engaged in, we see um, patterns or, or systems that can best influence the work of building community. And so this is what expand opportunity represents, that we blend the work of um, economic development and education and inclusion, or economy, I should say. It's not just economic development, but focus on economy and education and inclusion as a trio of work that together is a powerful mechanism for building community. And the key about this is that you can't really pick them apart, that you, you cannot look at a strong local economy without looking at the educational system or without looking at inclusion and paying attention to who's at the table. And there, of course, 75% of our grant making falls in this bucket, and there are a whole host of, of initiatives that fall into this bucket, and, and I just highlight a couple of them, uh, especially our broadband work um, that has opened up opportunities for rural Minnesotans to use or maximize the opportunities to use this access, especially entrepreneurs and students, to see open up opportunities for them to use this access to better their lives. And you might know that that, that program continues on, like I said, and that in this community, um, IEDC will be leading a collaborative effort because the Itasca area is an official broadband community under our new program in 2013. They will be leading an effort to figure out how to collaborate in this community, expand internet access, so that the high speed um, access can be available to all residents in the county. And of course, then finally, our early childhood work and our student success work also falls under this bucket of work, um, knowing that the success of every child is probably the cornerstone of long-term success for our community. Grant budget-wise, I look forward to that 2008 not being the marker any longer out there on the edge. It reminds us that after the uh, economy took a dip, that our grant budget has not quite recovered since then, and it might be yet a couple of years. This year, you will see a very slight decrease. It's almost an even to 2012, where our grants budget is right around 11.6 million, give or take, whereas last year in 2012, it was 11.7. But it is a stark change from the days of 14 and 15 million dollar grant pockets. And so we're still feeling that, which is probably why you see us pay increasing attention to what is it that we can do, but for the money. Again, I would point to the at-home publication, which outlines what we did in 2012 and what that picture looks like. And finally, Perhaps a few, a few changes. Those of you who were there last year will recognize that we've been working on this transition in database and systems behind the scenes. And I think last year you were told that there would be a new grants portal and a new environment for grantees to apply with the foundation, and it will still yet be a few months. What is working well, though, and just this week, my colleague Linda Jibo in the back um, has been visiting all the area schools to teach them how to access our online scholarship application. So that is now working and up and running, and we would encourage you to spread the, spread the word about that. As we, as you know, we give out close to a million dollars worth of scholarships to this community every year. So that portal is working. And I would pass on just a, a, a brief message from the grants team now that we are sort of a new team. They're going to have to get used to me. and. And I think I've definitely gotten used to them. They're amazing. Been wonderful to work with. Um, but I would say um, continue to talk with us. Our doors are open. 
even though we're busy. We juggle hundreds of requests and we try very hard to plan for our grant making two and even three years ahead. So when it is that you have bold or grand ideas, I know many of you are comfortable coming, but please know that you can always talk with us about what's on your mind and it's helpful for us to know what you know so that we can better stay in touch with the community. It is difficult for us to get out and about as much as we would like to. I see that challenge already and have vowed to work on that because we are, maybe for lack of a better, for lack of a better word, a lean team. Lots of work to do. So um, we love it when you come and, and talk with us. And we think also that in addition to the money, like I said, that we can connect you to our networks and our resources and that way aid in a different developmental process. Um, we're happy to share what we know, not only in this community, but in others uh, via different networks. And what will not change then is what we at the grants team look for from you. The kind of thoughtful requests that we see from you, requests for support um, that explain your plans to us well and let us know that you are connected to each other and that the plans that you bring forth are plans that you have already vetted with your peers and your community. And knowing that is very helpful for us. We, we live in such a complex world now and are so interconnected and sometimes it can be difficult for us to see through what it is for a system that you intervene in or add to when you come to us with ideas. So we encourage you to show us that and show us that you too are connected and adaptable and of strong leadership. So I know that during the last few gatherings that we've had, where I of course have not been present, but I know that, that um, there has been a lot of work and attention to how could this community, the nonprofit community and the public community work together better and strengthen its organizational capacity better. And so to me as a newcomer, I, I see, I think I see the results of that. I see amazing collaborative efforts in this community. I, I, I'm just astounded. I thought I came from a community that was collaborative, but this is, this is truly so. Um, and I, I, can, I encourage that continuation. I think I'll build on what Kathy said. I mean, to us, it's really evident, and it's, um, it's the way. It's the way to be, and, and in, our, in our estimation, too. And we like to see that. So the current resources that have, that have come out of this work, this desire from you to strengthen your organizations and learn how to work better together, have a lot of that work has come from the Nonprofits Assistance Fund. And many of you, I think 50 if not 60 organizations now, have taken advantage of the offerings that the Nonprofit Assistance Fund has to lend this community as far as strengthening our capability to um, interpret financial statements better, to plan better, to fundraise better, to do better board development, whatever it may be. Many of you have taken advantage of those opportunities and we encourage you to continue to do that. They are here in Grand Rapids once a month to respond to whatever need your community has. And if you are someone who is not aware of this mechanism, some of you may not be, and you want to get on the list to be in the know about what you can access, then please get on a list with Diana in the red in the back and make sure that they can uh, send emails to you so that you can know what's available to you. And also please note that our next nonprofit assistance event, so to say our next training on fundraising is on the 6th of February, right here. So for the remainder of the afternoon, I'm getting back to Bernadine. We thought that instead of getting together and quote unquote working and walking away with the sense that there's tasks to do as a result of the time here today, we thought it might be worthwhile to take a, a break from that, okay, what else can we do right now type of a mental exercise. And we thought it might be worth it to
pause and, and talk earnestly with each other and ask ourselves what it is collectively that we would like to see in this community over the next couple of years. And, and many of you have become familiar with that, so I want to call it the special sauce that uh, Bernadine in public policy and, and Valerie and the leadership team have, this um, attention that they have to setting up a great meeting and creating a space that's conducive to a different kind of conversation that fosters um, good thinking and good connections that will stay with you once you leave this room. And it's I hope that the conversation we can have this afternoon can be just that. Maybe a point of inspiration as you and your organizations go about planning for the next year or two, that you at least can look back on this event and say, you know, we talked about that back then. I wonder if we shouldn't pick up that idea now. So this kind of thoughtful conversation can be a catalyst, we think. 